Censorship is clearly one of the most serious problems facing our society and the world. Uh, recently, um, Facebook took down an interview conducted by Laura Trump uh, of her dad, former President Trump. So not only has Trump himself been prevented from posting, but now it turns out that even if you do interviews with him, by the way, remember, this is the leading voice in the Republican Party. This is the person setting the tone for the GOP for the future. And yet his conversations, even in a news context, even in an interview, are prohibited. Uh, recently, I interviewed attorney Sidney Powell. I was provoked to do this by an interview I saw uh, with Jake Tapper. Jake Tapper was talking about the Sidney Powell case with Dominion. And Jake Tapper was um, uh, jubilant about the fact that Sidney Powell had backtracked. She had reversed, he said, the statements that she made last year. She was now taking it all back. She was admitting that her statements were pure opinion and not fact. And I was like, wow, is this really true? So I asked Sidney Powell to come on my podcast. Uh, and she did. But I realized I can't post the podcast. Why? Because if I post it on certain platforms, such as YouTube, they will take it down. Why? On the same logic. That, you, uh, that Facebook took down President Trump's interview. So not only do we have censorship, but now we have, in a sense, the prospect of self-censorship. Uh, I don't want the video to be taken down. I obviously don't want to be banned. Uh, I don't want the podcast to be banned. So I don't post it on YouTube at all. Now, I did post it on Rumble, and you can watch it there. But this is the insidious nature of censorship. And it, like everything, it begins with one issue. So initially, digital media censorship began with, you know, you can't talk, you can't say certain things about, the, about um, COVID-19. You can't talk about hydroxychloroquine. That's, that's a no-no. We'll take you down if you do that. Then it moved to the election. Uh, you can't talk about election fraud. You can't talk about voter fraud. If you do, we'll take you down. And there's no reason to believe that this is not going to keep expanding to other issues. So I think to myself, who are the three biggest threats to free speech in the world? Who are the, who are the people shutting speech down on the most massive scale? Well, one of them is obviously Xi Jinping, the head of China, the dictator of China. This guy is regulating not only the speech, but the lives of a billion people. So that is horrific. But there are two other names that belong kind of in the same camp, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey. They have platforms that cover hundreds of millions, if not billions of people, and they are censoring kind of on the same scale. So they're not regulating our lives, but they are shutting our mouths. They're preventing us from discussing relevant issues. And this, I think, is a serious problem. Now, it's not just a problem, you may say, for civil liberties. It is. It is shutting down our free speech. Why? Because even though these are not government entities, they are quasi-government entities. Why? Because they enjoy government protections. They have Section 230 protection, which immunizes them from lawsuits and vulnerability. So they are allied with the government. They're getting special subsidies. Uh, and they are restricting our free speech rights because they are now the new public square. But it's more than that. They're also threats to our democracy. Just as Xi Jinping is, is a threat to democracy in China, he won't allow it. These guys are threats to democracy. Why? Because they are big enough that they control the flow of information that has a direct impact on democratic outcomes. Google searches, for example, they can rig the searches so you only see certain types of information. And a Google engineer testified recently, hey, they're able to shift really millions of votes in a single election. Or think about the ways in which the digital platforms conspired, worked together, worked in coordination or tandem to shut down uh, the Hunter Biden story. They're still covering for Joe Biden. In fact, they, when you look at Joe Biden's likes and dislikes, there are a lot of dislikes, so they take off the dislikes. So people can't see how unpopular this guy is, what a negative reaction, what a contemptuous reaction he provokes from people. But the point to make about these digital censors is not just that they are threats to civil liberties or democracy, they're threats to both, but they're also unbelievably dumb. They don't know what's going on. Now, they're good at certain things. They know how to program, but you know, every wife knows that her husband may be good in one thing and unbelievably stupid in everything else. You've got people who are good in one thing who don't know how to put their pants on properly. And so I think you, you can see, it's very obvious when these guys show up for any public 
hearing. Recently, um, uh, Ted Cruz, for example, was grilling Jack Dorsey uh, of Twitter. Uh, here's a few moments from that exchange. Listen. Topic, Mr. Dorsey, does voter fraud exist? I, I don't know for certain. Uh, are you an expert in voter fraud? No, I'm not. Well, why then is Twitter right now putting purported warnings on virtually any statement about voter fraud? We're, we're simply linking to a broader conversation so that people have more information. No, no, you're not. You put up a page that says, quote, voter fraud of any kind is exceedingly rare in the United States. That's not linking to a broader conversation. That's taking a disputed policy position. And you're a publisher when you're doing that. You're entitled to take a policy position, but you don't get to pretend you're not a publisher and get a special benefit under Section 230 as a result. That link is pointing to a broader conversation with tweets um, from publishers and, and people all around the country. <laughs> wow. Look at that guy. I mean, there are two things that strike me about him. The first is he's a moral coward. He's a moral coward because he can't take responsibility for his own decisions. He's got to say, oh, he's got to appeal to some neutral process. Well, we're, we're simply consulting processes out there. I mean, the obtuseness of this statement. Obviously, he's selecting what sources he wants to rely on. So he can't even take responsibility. He has to lean on these other sources or authorities. But the second thing, you're dealing with an absolute idiot. You're dealing with a guy who knows nothing about voter fraud. In fact, I would submit he knows very little about politics itself. So the very guy regulating our political discourse, and the same could be said of Zuckerberg, you've got these two digital nerds, um, and they decide what goes. They're the ones. So the point I want to make here is I think back to the old censors, because we think we've come in this modern era of free speech and civil liberties. And in the old days, you know, there was the Catholic Church. There was all this censorship. You couldn't. Books were burned. Um, books were prohibited. The church, of course, had its notorious index prohibitorum. Part of what I sh want to show, and I'll show this in the next segment in depth, looking at the Galileo case in particular, because we have a lot of information about that case, that the old censors, the old guys, the primitive guys, the guys from 200 years ago, were actually more refined, more judicious, more tolerant, and more sophisticated than our gang of idiots.